our approach as test continuous maintainers is to bring as little complexity, as little new tools, new concepts to our users as possible. We want them to do a small change and unlock major capability, like replace two lines and start testing with Postgres instead of H2. This is DevOps Paradox, episode number 187. Simplify testing with test containers. Welcome to DevOps Paradox. This is a podcast about random stuff in which we, Darren and Victor, pretend we know what we're talking about. Most of the time, we mask our ignorance by putting the word DevOps everywhere we can and mix it with random buzzwords like Kubernetes, serverless, CICD, team productivity, islands of happiness, and other fancy expressions that make us sound like we know what we're doing. Occasionally, we invite guests who do know something, but we do not do that often since they might make us look incompetent. The truth is out there, and there is no way we are going to find it. P.S. It's Darren reading this text and feeling embarrassed that Victor made me do it. Here are your hosts, Darren Pope and Victor Farson. Victor, how long has it been since you've written any test cases? Around 21 hours. You actually wrote test cases in the last 20 hours? 21 hours? Yeah, I was. I mean, some silly applications, some demo more than anything else, nothing serious, but yeah, I wrote tests for it. And you were writing tests? Were they in Go? Yes, they were in Go. And I'm assuming you were writing all those things and they were just running right on your machine bare metal. Uh, right on my machine initially. Initially, uh, yeah. Initially. There is always initially. Well, what if I said you didn't have to run it on your bare metal? Still local, but not on your bare metal. What should they write in? Spin up Vagrant? If you say that's the thing, we're going to finish this conversation quick. Now, that's usually where I go to, but that's a different conversation for a different day, as you said. <laughs> Today, we have Sergey on from Atomic Jar. Sergey, how are you doing? Hey, folks. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. And I love the start of this conversation. It gets me excited. Atomic Jar, you may not have heard of, but you may have heard of, especially if you're from the Java world, test containers. And Atomic Jar has some commercial offerings around that. We'll get to that later. You, you know the drill. You can never have listen to a podcast and not hear a pitch at some point. But we're going to hold the pitch for a bit. Does it mean that now I'm obligated to do a pitch of our product? Because I'm here to, later. Like, I'm excited to talk later. about our open source. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Let's let's talk let's talk about test containers. Let's 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 talk a little bit about the history of test containers, and we'll walk through of sort of the progression because it used to be just Java, but now it supports a lot more than just the Java language itself. So first of all, I'm glad that you mentioned Vagrant because that's actually one of my very first steps towards integration testing. It was Vagrant and Vagrant file. And uh, I mean, we went a really long path, like we as industry towards integration testing. And like I know stage zero is like not doing integration testing, but doing unit testing with mocking and all of that and not having enough confidence basically in what we're doing, especially with modern, all these like microservices and all of that, most of the code we write, we just read from a database, we transform and return to some other IO source. Maybe you send it to Kafka topic, maybe return as a REST uh, result. And seriously, do we really want to mock out like these major parts, just like Kafka, uh, Postgres and others? So I don't think it gives us the confidence we need. So being able to run a database and testing is kind of, mandatory part of uh, uh, modern uh, development, I would say. Uh, and I'm biased, of course, but 10 years ago, tooling wasn't there. And uh, Vagrant was a good option, actually, because what's important when it comes to testing is how do you make it consistent? How do you share it with other team members? How do you run the same thing on CI? You need to have some definition of how your environment is configured so that it, it can be reproducible. It's not just I installed my SQL on my machine and I can run my test, but then every other developer needs to do the same, same version of my SQL. And it actually leads me to the story of how test containers got created. And I want to talk about something else in between, but it reminded me of the original story that uh, Richard Norse, the creator of test containers told me that he kind of got bored of running with a CD, with Oracle on it, uh, and installing it on every developer's machine so that they can have a consistent testing experience. Because he was a Deloitte, they were actually very into integration testing. 
they really, really understood the value quite early and the tooling was kind of lacking. It was eight years ago and eight years ago, Docker, which now is on everyone's mind, back then Docker was an emerging technology. And uh, if today we can say that Docker is in production in many places, or at least uh, deliveries of uh, Docker, something like uh, Mobi or uh, ContainerD, back then it wasn't in production, like at all. But it started getting into software development lifecycle, uh, like CI services and local development. And Docker itself is a great abstraction. But what's missing is how to operate Docker. Yes, there was Fig, aka Docker Compose, uh, where you can branch a bunch, of, a bunch of YAML because everyone loves YAML, right? So you can write a ton of YAML and then you can start it uh, as your definition of your environment, which is already good. And it was a great improvement over Vagrant because in Vagrant, you would start VMs and it takes much more resources. With uh, Docker, you start containers, start faster, start everything. But starting this thing is half of the story while cleaning up the resources making sure that it starts on random ports and many other aspects that makes testing reliable and repeatable and consistent aren't in Docker because it's a generic tool. And this is how Richard came to an idea that, hey, if we create a tool or a library that later he decided that could talk to Docker because Docker is uh, just like HTTP APIs that anyone can call. But if I call this API directly from my tests, then I can orchestrate containers that are needed for my tests without having to learn a new tool, without having to require everyone to run commands. I can just do it straight from my tests. And that's how test containers got created. So it's real versus mocks. Can I say oh, I really dislike mocks? <laughs> we talk same language then, because it's not like I dislike mocks. But mocks are good, as, as one of our engineers, Manu, uh, said, and uh, test contains going maintainer. Like, mocks are good unless they are not. I'm very much of the same opinion. Like, uh, where it makes sense, I would go for mocks. Like, you know, if I can, if I'm writing unit tests for an algorithm, for example, it's, it's certainly fine to write a mock, like, uh, where it's applicable. We have mocks in test containers code base when we test test containers, because sometimes some things just impossible to integration test. But... I do prefer integration testing in the places where I can do integration testing because it gives me much more confidence with much lower cost of adding it to and maintaining it too because maintaining mock-based code is a nightmare. That I agree 100%. Uh, mocks are definitely the evil we had to live with because the, in the past, you know, setting up the system was far from easy, right? But now I feel that we have a different problem, right? Uh, like in the past, I, I dropped uh, very often mocks in favor of, hey, I'm, let me just pin this up as a container in one form or another, doesn't matter, and I'm good. But now with proliferation of microservices, we have a problem of quantity. It's not about spinning up a container. It's about spinning up one container, five containers, 50 containers, you know? You're working on a front end that speaks with the back end, uh, which in turn speaks with two other services, which in turn speaks with three databases. So it's, it's becoming complex for different reasons, right? That's an interesting topic that you touched. What's the scope of integration testing? How can we define the scope for integration tests? And where is the line between integration testing and end-to-end -end testing? Because speeding up the whole system, like uh, either on a firmware environment or on staging environment, is basically end-to-end -end testing. So like we have a running system and we poke it through you know, externally available APIs, for example. Since uh, we're here to talk about DevOps, I would like to also point out that in my opinion, DevOps really triggered the transformation in many areas, obviously, like how we deploy, how we structure our code uh, and all that, and also the shift left movement. For me, surprisingly, like I have a feeling that like there was home alone situation. Because testing was coming from home alone. Just like the whole family moved to a new fancy place and everyone was so excited that they kind of forgot about Kevin. Kevin is that testing question of this whole uh, DevOps transformation that was kind of missed out. Wow, we changed how we structure code. We changed how we package code, how we deploy it, how we orchestrate, how we monitor it. How we test code, we were like, 
yeah, we probably will continue deploying to staging and we'll be using Selenium browsers to just, uh, I mean, Selenium with browsers and we will be opening UI and going through buttons on the UI. My question is, does it really have to be like that? Like, or like, is it really optimal enough? This is why I'm so excited about integration testing. Like I'm a huge fan because uh, integration testing is shifting into the left. It's bringing this like missing, you know, like it brings Kevin back to the family, basically. This DevOps happy family who moved on, basically. While previously, like, you know, like 10, 15, 20 years ago, they go to testing. Like when people talk about testing, they're like, mm, yeah, probably it means like environments, browsers, and end-to-end -end testing. Thanks to DevOps, we can talk about proper developer-first testing, where developers would be testing the way they would prefer. And by the way, I keep saying that like shift left, shift left, shift left, you obviously find it on our website because that's actually what's happening. We're just shifting testing from left, oh, sorry, from, from the right, uh, where like pre-prod, staging, we're shifting it to the left, like CI, local development, local developer machines, uh, pull requests. It's a huge advantage because it's much faster feedback cycle. Ironically, I think part of this shift left uh, movement for testing must be represented by shift right movement in tooling. We should not be shifting the tooling from this old era where like staging environment existed and browser testing existed to the left. Instead, we should expand how developers were doing testing. Like if we let developers do testing, let them do testing. If developers know how to write unit tests, for example, like if they write code to test, then we should just expand it to starting real things. Let's replace mocks with real databases. That's already a gigantic step towards much better confidence. If we introduced infrastructure as code, if we introduced, I don't know, like deployment models as code, everything as code, why can't we do testing as code? Why can't we make testing part of just a unit test, let's say, or like integration testing? Just can we do it from unit tests? This is putting me back like 20 years or something when we had those discussions. Am I interpreting right what you're saying uh, by rephrasing it to that there is no space or at least not much for non-coders, including in testing ranks? I see what you mean. And I should clarify that. I think. It doesn't mean that we should make testing as complex as coding in the sense that, you know, like creating like advanced algorithms and all of that. No, not, not that, but kind of that is the testing still, I click something with the mouse and see whether the reaction is fine or, or are we talking about testing becoming part of the coding process? Are the tests code today or there's still something in an Excel sheet that people go through? Now I understand better. So I do think that, first of all, testing should be part of software development lifecycle. It shouldn't be later confirmations that uh, you did everything right. You should just use it to get an instant feedback, similar to how compilation is part of uh, the process. Like, we are not committing to CI service to see if it compiles or not. I mean, sometimes we do, but you know, hopefully not. Like we are compiling it in our IDE to get a confidence that we refer to the right variable name to the right class and so on and so forth. So similar thing here, we want to get nearly instant feedback on the change that we applied to our code. And I, as a developer, I wanted to make part of my software development lifecycle story. Like I'm in my IDE and I want to have feedback on the changes I'm making, and I want it to be as instant as possible. I don't want to package my application, deploy it to a staging environment, run some UI testing that requires the whole system to run. I would rather limit the scope to just my service. And then, uh, and there is a really awesome article by Martin Fowler, who is a pretty famous person out there, especially when it comes to testing. And he talks about the scope of integration testing. And what should be considered in the scope of integration testing? According to him, while there's a bit of ambiguity, like what integration testing is, is it like more like end-to-end -end testing or it's more narrowed down? He talks about how integration testing could be considered starting multiple services, but you may as well start your service, your code under development, it's direct dependencies. So let's say I'm writing a service that receives a, I don't know, it's supposed a rest endpoint, then sends it to Kafka, 
and then listens to Kafka and stores something in Redis. Mm, just, I don't know, some random service. To test it, I don't need user service. I don't need notification service. I don't need a bunch of other services in my system. What I really need is Postgres, Kafka, and Redis. And even if I have interactions with other services, I may as well use network level stubs, so like WireMock, Mock Server, and others. Martin also talks about uh, the concept of contract testing that can help verify that even though I mocked out external service at the network level, the contract I'm talking to that service, and not just payloads, but rather the contract, is correct. The reason why we need that is because, as you said, it becomes very, very complex. When you start a Greenfield project, yeah, you have two services, it's very easy to start them. But imagine something like, I don't know, Netflix. And Netflix are active users of task containers, but I don't think anyone in the world knows how to start Netflix from scratch. There is no such thing as ephemeral Netflix. It's like thousands of microservices, I think, or hundreds or thousands, I don't, I don't know, like maybe millions. It grows every day. But it's very expensive to start ephemeral Netflix, even if it's possible, and it's not needed in some sense. No, on, on that I agree completely. Basically, the scale with which we are operating today makes end-to-end -end integration testing unrealistic, right? right? Kind of, as you said, I'm not going to spin up whole Netflix so that I see whether my latest commit works. And the only alternative to that is that I can ensure that I work, right? Which is my free flow interpretation of contract testing, right? I can ensure that whatever I'm sending somewhere fulfills the contract and I must have certain level of faith that whatever is beyond that something did the same, right? Uh, did its own part of testing. So yeah, contract testing is probably, at least in my head, replacement for the reality of the complexity of end-to-end -to -end testing today. You mean the combination of integration testing combined with contract testing? You know, depends how you define integration testing. You're not going to get the whole system to verify whether your specific work together with hundreds of other people's works, commits coming multiple times a day is going to work, right? So, so kind of testing the whole system when we're talking about big system is becoming unrealistic. Uh, at least not in the terms of I'm doing it on every change. Yes, maybe once a day when we might do end-to-end -end, what's or not, but if you're talking about frequent, rapid development, right, where, where I'm releasing my part of the story once a day or more frequently, end-to-end -end testing is out of the picture. Simply, the, the laws of physics prevent me from doing it. And then the best I can do is verify that uh, my contract with the rest of the system is fulfilled. Yeah, maybe if I have dedicated Postgres, I'm going to spin up Postgres database, right? If it's mine. But the moment I go outside of the domain of my service, I, I can just go for contract, not much more. Agreed, agreed. We're talking about integration testing, but usually before you can get to integration testing, you had to have gone through unit testing. So can test containers help me even on the unit testing side of things? I would say test containers is unit testing on steroids. One advantage of test containers, uh, especially as compared to other solutions on the market, and I'm not saying that test containers is the only integration testing solution out there. For example, you'll find many startups who currently are focusing on ephemeral environments uh, who can copy your like, I don't know, production Kubernetes definitions and create ephemeral environments per request. Like let's say like you're, you're building your pull request and you're getting an ephemeral environment for it uh, to test. First of all, it couples you to Kubernetes, but also it requires you to change how you test. And it's a major change from unit testing to this type of testing. While with test containers, you can gradually improve the testing of your services. Improvement can also be from zero tests to some tests with integration uh, testing with test containers. Let's say if you already have an extensive test suite with unit tests, then probably you have places in your code where you go deeper, 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 and boom, we interact with database and we mock it out or we start in memory database. So in Java world, for example, there is a very popular solution called H2. You can start in memory H2 instance that will 
emulate you know, SQL databases. Like uh, they have emulation mode for Postgres, for MySQL, I think, and for others. But it's known that it has issues because every emulation will eventually have inconsistency in implementation with the original technology. It can be like 80% uh, uh, correct, it can be 90% correct, but you never know whether this remaining 10% would make it boom in production or not. Another thing is that you always need to uh, kind of maintain it. Like it's a maintain maintenance burden uh, that you have. Uh, and like you want to use new API from Postgres and apparently it's not supported by H2, something like that. JSON functions probably are not supported and those are powerful, like really, really powerful. What task containers allows, it allows you to add a dependency to your code. So like similar to how you add dependencies for other libraries, you start depending on task containers and you define containers as objects. So any even entry-level developer can now start Oracle, Kafka, DB2, and a variety of other technologies, all with the same library, just by saying new Kafka container, Kafka.start. And then you have Kafka running. And you can also introspect it. You can say Kafka.getbootstrap servers, and you have the required information that you need to connect Kafka client to a real Kafka that is running there. Another advantage is that since uh, it uses real Docker containers, like real images of Kafka, the same, and Kafka is just an example, like we support a variety of technologies, and there is also generic support for any Docker Hub image. But let's say Kafka, when you run Kafka in production, let's say with Confluent Kafka operator, you would be using this very same Docker images that you can start locally. You don't need to run Kafka cluster with Kafka operator with uh, la 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 to just run the same image. And test containers gives you that instance of Kafka with exactly the same version as in production, but on demand locally as ephemeral resource that you start from your tests, from your code. So it feels like unit test but it runs with real dependencies. So what you're telling me is if I'm running, I don't remember versions for Kafka, mm -hmm. but if I'm running Kafka 1.2.3 mm -hmm. in production, I can configure my code when it runs the unit test or whatever test, doesn't mm -hmm. matter, to also run Kafka 1.2.3. Exactly. And you can even fine tune it with production parameters. Like how often does it write to file system or retention period uh, and other parameters? Like every production parameter that's available there, we can also change it because you run exactly the same code thanks to containers. But wouldn't that result in a sort of duplication? Because if my Kafka is running, as you mentioned, you said operator, right? And if I would like to run it, run it with production settings, I would actually need to decrypt in a way reinterpret all the all the settings that are used in an operator and the results of those settings when they're expanded in a cluster so kind of reproducing product i mean i understand i completely agree that using the same container image is highly beneficial but production settings that would be a tough one right because a lot would need to be reproduced for the majority of people even understanding what the operator does behind the scenes. Just that part is extremely difficult. The question here is whether you need to replicate all the settings or only those that are relevant for your application. I cannot really, <laughs> out of my head, uh, imagine the settings that you'd really need to copy for production for Kafka. I can imagine for other technologies. That's kind of my point. That, that That's why I slightly disagree. It's kind of like there is no strong need for production settings that you mentioned, right? What you really need is Kafka. I have an example. Let's say you want to test your, that your application is working correctly with transactions in Kafka. And uh, you want to ensure that it works correctly with a replication factor of uh, two, let's say, in a cluster of three nodes. And um, test containers gives you the API with, uh, with which you can start cluster combined of three Kafka nodes that are connected to each other. And you can connect your test application to that cluster. You don't need to replicate all the settings, especially back, like how backhopping is done, how file system operations are working, because those are production optimizations. But what's important to you is that your application is connecting to a few Kafka instances at once and is still working correctly. Is a scenario I would test locally before I publish to production, knowing that in production we are running cluster with multiple Kafka nodes with Quorum. So let me 
take us down a different example here. If you go out and take a look at the documentation at testcontainers.org, one of the quick starts shows we're spinning up Redis, which is fine. Redis is going to be lightweight, no big deal. Do I actually have to run? This is going to be a, sound like a silly question, but hopefully it makes more sense. Do I really have to have Docker? Docker proper? Or do I only really need the runtime under Docker? Choosing container D or whatever. What what are the, the real requirements for me in order to actually use test containers? Test containers works with any Docker compatible API provider. So it can be Docker desktop, it can be a Rancher desktop, which uh, starts the same Mobi underlying project behind Docker. It can be Podman because they have Docker API compatibility mode. It can be Kalima, another way of running Mobi on uh, Mac OS. It can be remote Docker. For example, it's not uncommon in CI environments to run, let's say you're using Tecton, like very modern uh, CI solution out there. As I said, we depend on Docker, uh, Docker API, because Docker API remains, remains the best API out there for integration testing. We cannot just replace it with, let's say, Kubernetes API, because it doesn't support all the operations we need, and I can talk about them in a second, to run with just Kubernetes. So you need Docker. Some of our users, they just start Docker, let's say, as a sidecar container, so that you have your container that runs your CI code, let's say, I don't know, Go test or something like this, and then you have Docker running as a sidecar for it, where containers are started. The interaction is over network, but of course there is uh, another option uh, where it's not desired to have Docker at all, but you still want to run test containers based tests. And that's uh, our product, which gives managed environment for running those things. But uh, here I am, I, I thought I would not be talking about our product, but out of scope was this conversation. But as long as you have Docker endpoint you can connect to, then you're good with test containers. So I would go ahead and spin up whatever the real system is that I need based on image and tag, do my jobs. I think about these things. Let's say I've got a system that's Kafka, Redis, Postgres, HashiCorp Vault, and like let's add in just a couple more things. It seems like I have to have quite a bit of capacity to be able to run this. Am I missing something? You would be surprised uh, how, li how little is needed sometimes for even the most major databases to start. Usually we talk about having, I don't know, four gigs of RAM available to Docker to be able to run basically everything. Because as we just discussed, uh, the scope is actually, especially thanks to microservices, scope is very small you probably will not end up starting tens of containers. Yes, like one to five is common. From the technologies that you mentioned, I think the biggest would be Kafka. Like Postgres consumes just a little of RAM uh, and starts fast. Redis uh, and uh, Vault, especially Vault. Vault is a really, really tiny one thanks to Going. Kafka is Java-based technologies, so it requires a gig of RAM or so to start. For some technologies, for example, Elasticsearch and Cassandra, we also fine-tune them. And in fact, uh, sometimes vendors, because they are also very supportive of test containers as the way of testing their technologies. So for example, Elasticsearch module is maintained by Elastic. We also just added Red Panda, for example, which is a very lightweight Kafka alternative. But for Kafka and Cassandra, we fine tune the configuration so that it can start fast and it will be consuming. So in production, it's fine to start with, let's say, 10 gigs of RAM because you will probably end up using all of them. In testing, if you just need to send five messages and read them back, you probably don't need 10 gigs of RAM for that. And we always optimize the images for startup, but also the overhead and impact on resources in your machine. Because most of test containers users are running test containers based tests with Docker that is part of their environment, like on their laptop, for example. And obviously they need RAM for Chrome, for Slack, and other applications too. So it does add the resource requirement to your machine, but it doesn't mean that you absolutely have to have 32 gigs of RAM on your laptop to be able to run this thing. It's actually a couple of gigs is enough to run most of the technologies. So how do I go about getting those containers into 
the proper state for the test to run. We'll throw Postgres out there. How do I get all the data loaded up into Postgres that I know that I'm going to need in order to run this test? That's a good question. It's one of the hidden features of test containers, by the way, that the containers that we start, we also have wait strategies that are way beyond just checking that the port is listening. And even for listening for the port, like most of the solutions out there, for example, like I know that there is one in Docker Compose, like a script that you can run to check that the thing is listening on the port. What happens sometimes is that the port is exposed internally, but Docker, especially on Docker macOS, uh, takes time to re-expose it on localhost because it's a virtual machine, so we need to re-expose it. If you do it with Docker Compose or just Docker Run, then you notice flakiness of your tasks. Like sometimes they will fail because the database is not ready. Or the, way, the other way around. It's listening on localhost, but not internally yet because it's proxying. In task containers, we have wait strategies that can check for example, port strategy checks for both internal and external port. That internally it's listening, but also externally you can open the port as well. We also have log strategy. We wait for a certain line in the log and container output before we say that container is running and ready to accept connections. Or SQL strategy. Like we might as well just run select one from SQL databases and ensure that the database is ready to serve queries. To answer your question about getting the data into those containers, and it does add to the startup time because uh, you need to process this data, we support initialization strategies, uh, especially it, it must be supported by the image. And sometimes we support it with external integrations, for example, Cassandra. But you can, for example, say that here is my dump.sql file. Dear test containers, please start this container with this SQL file in it uh, or like with this uh, data from the SQL file, so that when I run my tests, I start uh, the container uh, pre-filled with test data. You can also use uh, your favorite database migration tool for doing that. And it's actually a preferred way just because you have more control and you get it closer to how you do it in production. So for example, schema initialization, you should just point your migration tool, let's say Flyway or in other languages, there are also migration tools, but it's just better, but uh, there is also built-in support for initializing the initial state uh, of the database where it's supported. But it's widely supported in SQL databases and other non-SQL databases or no-SQL databases offer these too. For example, Cassandra. It sounds like what we would want to do really is use Flyway or Liquibase or one of those other types of tools to help load that up versus baking specific images with data sets already in them. Because I mean, I guess that's still an an okay option as well, but it's just extra overhead for whoever has to maintain them. Precisely, I would say. It is a good optimization where it makes sense. And for some databases, it takes a long time to initialize, for example, Oracle. It makes sense to pre-bake your image. I'm also a big fan of tasks that generate their test data from the test. So you're not relying on the state in the database, but rather you can read your test and you can understand the state a test will be testing. I also know very well the approach where you start maybe with obfuscated dump of your production database uh, and then you run tests against them. There is also a new tool that's about to be released or maybe by the time this podcast is released, it will be released by Synthesize who created a tool and they integrate with test containers uh, for that to generate, to synthesize test data based on schema. Very powerful because then you can only have schema and uh, create a bunch of test information inside the database. I would say my go-to solution, my personal go-to solution would be to use the tools I already have. Let's say if I have Flyway, I will just continue using Flyway. And our approach as test containers maintainers is to bring as little complexity, as little new tools, new concepts to our users as possible. We want them to do a small change and unlock major capability, like replace two lines and start testing with Postgres instead of H2. Replace three lines and start testing with Kafka instead of, I know, embedded Kafka that brings color with it and doesn't work properly sometimes and a bit flaky. So that's our approach. But if you want to, you can always do those optimizations, for example, pre-bake test data into the database. That is also supported by Test Containers API. So we've been talking about a lot of different Java things, but Test Containers also supports not just Java, the language, but pretty much any language based on the JVM. At least that's 
Is, is that still true? I would even expand it. Task Containers isn't just a JVM project. Yes, you can use it with any JVM language out there, but also Golang, Node.js, .NET, Python, a bunch of others, Rust, and the craziest ones that I've seen was Haskell. <laughs> But uh, some of them are community maintained. Some are also maintained by us, Atomic Jar, the company behind Test Containers. Currently, we have in-house maintenance of Test Containers Java, Golang, and .NET. So what was it like maintaining Golang for this? Because I imagine when this first started out, because who was the guy that started it? What was his name? Richard? So the whole thing was started by Richard Norris. Yes. So when Richard started this, it was probably just Java, correct? So what made you want to bring this, especially as a company in Atomic Jar, to the other languages? I think it's important to say that Test Containers is almost eight years old. And Atomic Jar is two years old, or officially one and a half years old. Meaning that Test Containers existed for so long before we started the company that like, you cannot even say that some of these, or like none of these projects, uh, like none of these language uh, implementations were created when Atomic Jar started, but they existed before. The story of Test Containers Golang is, inter is an interesting one. There was a developer who really enjoyed using Test Containers Java, and it was six years ago or five years ago. And then he changed job, he joined Influx Data, and uh, at Influx Data, the company behind Influx DB, they are obviously a Golang uh, shop and everything they're doing, they're doing it in Golang. And uh, he wanted to have the same experience as he had with Test Containers Java, but in Golang. So he went ahead and created Test Containers Golang. The idea was that to follow the same idea, let's just talk to Docker directly from TAS and spin up resources from TAS without leaving the ID so that the developers don't need to you know, like learn new tool, basically, but they just code their test setup. And then Test Containers Golang was uh, the first non-Java uh, version of Test Containers, but then all these other versions started appearing because developers were really picking up the idea of integration testing straight from your IDE. And it's a very powerful, very simple yet powerful concept. So this is how we ended up with all these versions of Test Containers. And we've mentioned the company name, Atomic Jar. Why did you decide to create Atomic Jar? So the story of Atomic Jar is, and my story with Test Containers started uh, almost seven years ago, just half a year ago into Test Containers existence when I was at Zero Turnaround DevTools company from Estonia, the company behind famous J Rebels that uh, most of Java developers were not so happy because every second forum would be Yes, you're right. By the way, check Jarable. So for those who recognize that, sorry, but I wasn't part of the Jarable team. But we were at Zero Turnaround and we had sort of our own internal task containers. Same idea. Let's just talk to Docker API from tests and start containers so that we can test our Java agents uh, with a variety of databases and application servers. I discovered task containers on GitHub by just looking at one of uh, like you know, on GitHub, you look at the issue and you see cross-references from other repos, very powerful feature, by the way, that's how you build open source communities, just by seeing those references, actually. But uh, I know it's a reference from Task Containers. I was like, okay, like Docker testing containers. I should definitely check that one. I fell in love, so I joined the project, started contributing uh, as like open source junkie. I always do that if I discover that there is some open source thing I can contribute to. Later, Richard invited me to be a maintainer. And uh, later, we also got Kevin, our third maintainer of Test Containers Java and our employee number one at Atomic Jar. But we never worked on Test Containers as our main job. It was always uh, like side gigs that we were running two years ago. And in seven days, uh, and today's is, uh, or like, just like uh, in seven days from today, will be exactly two years since I announced that I'm leaving VMware, uh, the company where I worked before funding Atomic Jar. I ended up at VMware after they acquired Pivotal, the company uh, where, I, uh, where I used to work as part of the Spring team. As the acquisition happened, VMware was a bit too big for me because I'm more of a like, small startups guy. And I announced that okay, I'm leaving VMware, I have no idea where I'm going, but I want to do something cool. And obviously like task containers is one of the things I want to work on. I thought that I would end up at like one of these like software vendors, so like Red Hat, Microsoft, Google and others. I mean, Google is not software, but you get what I mean. 
one of our active test continuous users, he reached out to me in DM and said, hey, have you considered commercializing test containers? Because uh, I'm a big fan, I'm a business owner, I migrated all my projects to test containers over summer, I see a lot of potential, like, do you have any ideas? We did have the idea of test containers cloud floating around because uh, as you said, like Docker basically taxes your machine and re requires uh, resources in your machine. You also must have Docker in your machine or like Docker available to you to run it. And that creates a lot of uh, complexities that can be just removed with a managed service, similar to other managed services. So I shared the idea of Test Containers Cloud uh, with that person. It was like, hey, I'm an angel investor and I have a uh, you know, like spare to 50K and, uh, you know, like I, I would actually like, I would like to invest into this idea. Like I think that will be huge. Surprisingly, we changed the conversation from, okay, I'm just looking for a job to, I start pitching the idea of, hey, let's start the company to other two maintainers, uh, Richard and Kevin. Half a year later, we ended up closing our seed round, like 4 million seed round. And here we are building our product and continue building our community. But that's one of the best things that happened in my career. So you went from VMware via Pivotal Mm -hmm. to nothing, to, hey, here's some spare cash, go do this for me. Yep, precisely. <laughs> Pretty much it. But at that stage, Test Containers was already at uh, 6 million downloads a month or 7 million downloads a month. Google Cloud Next included uh, uh, Test Containers since their keynote in 2020. It was already used by Spotify, Capital One, Uber, VMware, Google, Red Hat, uh, and a ton of other companies. Um, a ton so, of other no-name companies is what you're telling me. Uh, yeah, like companies that nobody yeah. knows. Yeah, nobody knows like Uber and some Capital small One. SMBs from you know like from some yeah. like third third world countries. <laughs> I was I was sort of joking. You know, big companies here and little companies. Everybody's using it. six million downloads a month. That is uh, measurable. Is how we say that. <laughs> that is not that is not Taco Bell downloads. That's Chipotle downloads, right? That's <laughs> that's big. So as we're wrapping up here, mm -hmm. you have the uh, Atomic Jar Cloud. What, what what is the proper name for it? Is test it Test Containers Cloud. Cloud? Okay, Test Containers Cloud. And right now, it is currently in private beta. I believe that's correct. Is that correct? Yes. Do you have a rough GA time on that? So uh, we are without giving working, dates away, <laughs> of course, of course. But we are currently working on uh, GAing it, and we are running private beta for a year. In November, it will be a year, and we collected a lot of feedback and a lot of inbound demand for it. But we wanted to make it right before we release it for everyone, before we remove the gate uh, and like sign up list and all of that. We want to release it by January, or maybe on podcast, I should say by Q1, just to not to overpromise, but. I'm also excited about getting this thing released because uh, I believe, based on what I see, it will make so many developers out there just happy because they can, you know, like struggle less with them running their tests. That's a great motivation because I'm a developer, uh, so I, I feel the pain firsthand to just get the product in my hands. And if you want to sign up for that private beta, you can go to testcontainers.cloud. And again, with this episode coming out on November 30th. It will probably still be in private beta, but you never know. So you should always check. So Sergey, thanks for joining us today. All of your contact information is going to be down in the show notes, but if people wanted to get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? So what I want to say is that since you mentioned that it will still be private beta, but if you're listening it and if you're signing up for Test Contains Cloud, just add a comment that you're coming from DevOps Paradox and I'll make sure that you're not spending in the queue for too long. I'll try to expedite it as much as I can. Let's bring a little bit of exclusivity here. Not something we ever done before, but I think that's a good idea. When it comes to contacting me, uh, some people are active on LinkedIn, some people are acting in other places like Facebook. I'm really Twitter addictive, like, you know, like Twitter is my social network. So the easiest way to find me is to go to Twitter and find me, but it, it goes by B side up. But you can also find me, of course, uh, on LinkedIn uh, and a bunch of other places. If we talk about old school communication styles, then you can, of course, find me on email and it is uh, sergey at atomicjar.com. Pretty easy to uh, remember too. And last but not least, we have a very, very active community uh, of other test addicts. So we can jump, uh, we can join our Slack, for example, and you'll find this information from testcontainers.org website. There is a Slack invitation. And of course, uh, we have GitHub discussions and other places to 
communicate with the community uh, directly. So find me in the test containers community. Sergey, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, Darren. Thank you so much, Victor. Really great show. Pleasure to be here. We hope this episode was helpful to you. If you want to discuss it or ask a question, please reach out to us. Our contact information and a link to the Slack workspace are at devopsparadox.com slash contact. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, be sure to leave us a review there that helps other people discover this podcast. Go sign up right now at devopsparadox.com to receive an email whenever we drop the latest episode. Thank you for listening to DevOps Paradox. Thank you.